for coming, y'all. Um, I was listening to all the conversations and everybody just chatting and sharing lunch, and I feel like there aren't enough places where we do that anymore, and we don't do that enough anymore. Just take the time to get together with people and share a meal at a common table and, and eat and swap a few stories. And so this is the perfect place for me to get to swap a few stories with you about this new book. Um, if you haven't looked at the banner, there's a little bit of the real history there. That's my low-tech uh, solution to a slideshow because this way I don't have to worry about cameras and a screen and will the projector work and all that. So that's a little bit of the real life history from the archives in Memphis. This is really my favorite kind of book talk because when I go to a library I know that I am among book people and book people are my people. Um, I have been a book nerd since Ms. Crackhart told me in the first grade that I was going to be a writer. And you know, I just believed her because first grade teachers don't lie. <laughs> so I just always thought I could. I didn't grow up in a family who thought a writer was something you would really be for a living. But I just always thought I would because Miss Crackhart said I would. And um, I went to college, got a practical degree because my parents insisted on it. But I always wanted to be a writer, and I've been very fortunate to have um, gotten to do that pretty much all my working life. This is book number 30 for me. And there is this thing, though, y'all, that you dream about when you think you're going to be a writer as a young person and you see writers on TV. And on TV, it looks very glamorous. They drive around in Ferraris and. Um, they go to the grocery store and people recognize them and they're on the front of magazine covers and um, their editors are always calling and when is that book going to be done and, and they live in mansions on the beach and all that sort of thing. And you get into the writing business and you find out that for most people it's not really like that. Uh, but you still kind of hang on to this dream of having that book that goes to auction between all the big publishers and everybody's bidding on it and all that and this is book number 30 but this was that book for me this book um has has been the dream book uh, my agent put it out on uh wednesday by thursday 10 of the biggest publishers wanted to see it by friday we had what for me was a huge preempt offer on it my agent said i, I don't think we should take it I think we'll do better. Let's wait and let it go to auction next week. So I took my agent's advice and then I moped all weekend <laughs> because I just, you know, I just thought nobody's going to want it and then they're going to know that they don't want it either. And so then I really messed up. But it went to auction the next week and I was having conversations with the heads of all these publishing companies and you know, just thinking really things like this don't happen to people like me. But it's been the dream. It was in People Magazine last week as a people pick. So whatever else happens with this book. Oh, and they just, as I was coming here, I found out it's already gone into its third printing. Um, yes. So Gastonia is good luck for me. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's book number 30. So um, it's an example of, of how to achieve your dreams in 30 books or less. <laughs> there are a few things that people always ask me when a book comes out, so I thought I'd answer those, and then if you have a question or two about any of the real history or whatever, I can answer those. People always ask me, does any of this come from your real life? Um, I don't have, I didn't grow up in an orphan house. I, I don't have any close experience with adoption in my family, although my brothers try to tell me I was adopted. <laughs> but we look a lot alike, so that really, I never believed it. Um, but this story, because it's about Memphis, it is a river story. The river is the heart and soul and identity and lifeblood of Memphis. And I do know about life on a river. As kids, we grew up in this little neighborhood that was a little sort of horseshoe shaped neighborhood surrounded by cow pastures. It was out there in the middle of nowhere. Every house sat on an acre or two. So it was this little neighborhood of about 30 houses. 
And right through the middle of this neighborhood ran a little creek right through the middle of the horseshoe. And to us, that creek was the Nile and the Mississippi and the Congo. And we were Tarzan and Zorro and Laura Ingalls Wilder. And, you know, we just, that was the source of endless adventure for us. And we would go out the door in the morning uh, as soon as we had eaten our bowls of cereal. And you know, as long as we showed up by the time the streetlights came on at night, nobody wondered about us. Nobody worried about where we were. Uh, if it got to be lunchtime and we were hungry, we just went into whatever house we were closest to. And, and the mama there fed you. Every house had a mom in it pretty much. And the mama fed you. And she probably had a Kool-Aid made up because you could make about two and a half gallons for two cents or something. <laughs> And if she, was, if she was really swanky, um, she had the, the little Tupperware popsicle Kool-Aid <laughs> thingies. And, um, you know, that was really a treat, but you had to be sure you gave back the stick because if you messed up somebody's Tupperware, you were in serious jeopardy. But that was life. We would go down that creek. We would pack our backpacks, and we would journey until we thought we were just miles from home, and wild animals might eat us, and... They might have to call the police because we'd be camped out overnight on the creek because we couldn't get back and, and all these things. And it would get to be supper time. And that was back before cell phones. So what happened at supper time, most of you all probably know, the mamas came to the back doors and the mama calls went out. And so we'd be down the Congo swinging on vines with Tarzan and we'd hear, <laughs> Julie, Annabeth, Laura. And so we'd climb up out of that creek, and we were still in somebody's backyard. But it was such a separate world. When you were, it had dug its way down 8, 10 feet into the soil. And when you were down in that creek, you weren't aware of anything going on up on the top. That whole world just disappeared. And we were in this world of, of little leaf boats and sticks filled with dragonflies floating by and just childhood imagination and the water and thing, the sunlight and the change of seasons and that's all we were aware of. And that is exactly the life these kids in the story, these five little kids who are growing up on this shanty boat in the Mississippi River, that's the life they live. They're very unaware of the world outside like most shanty boat people, which it wasn't a real uncommon lifestyle um, during the Depression era when the book is set. Um, it wasn't uncommon for people who lost their farm or lost their job or just wanted to to kind of cobble together a shanty boat and take to living on the water. And most of the craft were drift craft. Um, they literally just drifted down the river north to south and they might dock up at a town. They might work a month or two or put the kids in school a little while and then they'd drift on. And when they got all the way south, um, they would get a tow behind a, a motorized boat of some kind, and they'd go back up north however far they wanted, and they'd do it all again. And during the Depression era, there were 50,000 people living this way on shanty boats. So that's the background of the story, and these kids live this river life right up until their lives intersect with what is going on in Memphis in 1939. People also ask me... Uh, where did the story come from? How did I find out about it? Um, how much of the story is true and how much is fiction? Every story for me has a spark and it's usually some part of history that I, I run across. It may be a story someone tells me. It may be something I see on TV, read in the newspaper, a historical marker I see where we've stopped to empty the trash on a roadside trip. I mean, I never, ever, ever know what's going to come up and what's going to spark in my mind a story that I think, you know, that needs to be told. How would I tell it? And this story had such a spark, and it came in the dark of midnight for me. I had never heard of Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home Society and this corrupt system of orphanages in Memphis. Um, the true stories behind this book are both a parent's fondest dream and a parent's worst nightmare. And even though I'm close to the, the river history of it because of growing up on the water, I'm closest to um, the parenthood part of this story. Because as I'm writing about these orphanages and what happened to the families who got caught up in this, I couldn't help but picture my own kids at 2, 5, 10, 12, you know, what they knew, what their lives were like, how life would have been for them 
if they were taken into one of these uh, orphanages and you know didn't know what was going on, didn't know why they were there, didn't know when they were going to see their parents again, maybe they're separated from their siblings, you know, and I couldn't help also thinking of myself as a parent, you know, what if somebody took my kids and I couldn't get them back? So just to put you in that space a little bit, imagine with me now, it's the mid-20s through 1950 sometime, you are a person who desperately wants to be a parent. You live in a culture where everybody within a year or two of getting married starts having children. Not less than nine months. My grandmother's baby was born nine months to the day after the wedding, and the old women were counting, believe me. But this is the world you live in. People have babies as, pretty much as soon as they can after marriage, and it is not happening for you. And years go by, and it is not happening. And maybe you finally decide you're going to try to adopt, and you apply you know, maybe to the Catholic orphanage or the Methodist orphanage or the Baptist orphanage or whatever's near you or your county services. And perhaps because you are, maybe you have a divorce in your history, maybe you're over 30, heaven forbid, um, maybe you and your husband are different religions or different denominations of the same religion. For whatever reason, you are not able to adopt. Your years go by, you never get a child, you get to be over 30, and they tell you you're too old, you, won't, you will never get a child. You're heartbroken, of course, and all of a sudden, though, you hear, maybe you read it in the newspaper, maybe you meet someone, a neighbor, or someone tells you, somehow you hear about a place where you are going to be able to go and make that dream come true just like that, that fast. And not only that, you are going to be able to pick hair color, eye color, age, gender, maybe specific talents you would like the child to have, art or music or high intelligence. I mean, it sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? Little made-to-order Stepford robot children or something. But this is the 20s through the 50s. So these are real kids, and they have to be coming from somewhere. The other side of that story is the very dark history behind the Tennessee Children's Home Society in Memphis at this time. Imagine with me now that you are a parent who's down on your luck. You, maybe you're a single mother whose husband has died or left the family. You have kids to raise and take care of. Maybe you're a young woman who's gotten pregnant with a man who will not marry you. Maybe you are an intact family, but um, you've lost your farm, the dad's lost his job, however it's happened, you've fallen on hard times. Your kids are hungry, maybe they're sick and need medical care, in some way you are needy, you live, stay, or stop over in or around Memphis. You go to a, maybe a, a, f a free food clinic to get milk or cheese or bread for your kids. Maybe you go to a medical clinic that advertises free care for the kids. Maybe if you're pregnant, you go, you answer an ad in the paper that says young ladies in trouble can get free care here. For some reason, you um, go to one of these places. The people there are very nice to you. They offer all kinds of help. What you do not realize is you have just surfaced on the radar of Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home Society. It is very likely you will turn around one day and your children will be gone. And if you even know what happened to them, if you try to go get them back, if you can muster the resources to go to court and fight for them, you will simply be told they have been adopted by people who can give them much more than you can, and you will never get them back, and if you still want children, you might as well just go and have some more. That is the reality of what was happening in these decades in Memphis. Children by the dozens disappeared from ramshackle front porches and front yards in the poor parts of town. Um, they disappeared from hospital maternity wards and their mothers were told they had died. They disappeared from shanty boat camps along the river. They disappeared from dirt roads, whole groups of siblings as they were walking home from school. The story of what happened to them is heartbreaking, 
and it's shocking and because it goes up to 1950 it's not even that long ago it came to me just out of the dark of midnight I was up late one night working on deadline for another book I had left the TV on because it gets lonely when you're gonna pull an all-nighter and but I had turned the sound off so I'm just working it's like 2 in the morning I look up at the TV and on the screen is this big white house and it's an episode of Investigation Discoveries, Deadly Women, called Above the Law, about women who are above the law for some reason. And inside the front room of this big house with these white columns, it's just lined with baby bassinets. They're just nose to tail in this room. And the bassinets are full of babies. Some have a couple babies, some have one. Some babies are sleeping and talking, and some look kind of sweaty and sickly and skinny. and a nurse kind of walks through and you know I'm looking at him thinking what is this what is this about because I love history and I'm also thinking don't turn on the sound <laughs> you are supposed to be working <laughs> but in a, a, a couple scenes later a woman takes a baby in an old-timey pram and the baby's kind of sickly and sweaty looking and she wheels it out in the sun and just leaves it there and I'm thinking what is this about what is happening here and so I turned it on and I took in the story of Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home Society and what was happening and how they got away with it for so long this went on for the better part of three decades how she got away with it um, to the public she was just this innocuous seeming grandmotherly looking woman she came from the upper crust of society she drove around in a limousine and lived in a big house and had a farm outside town where she kept her riding horses that she liked to ride. There was no reason for anyone to think she needed to be making money off the adoption business. People just thought she was a person who cared greatly for the welfare of children. She modernized the business of adoption. Prior to that, you probably wouldn't have adopted a child um, it was more of an orphan train type scenario where people took in kids to work. My husband's um, father's father raised some kind of feral boys who just were kids who didn't have a home and you know they became uncle so-and-so and uncle so-and-so but they really weren't related to the family. But you probably wouldn't have taken a child in and adopted it to be your heir and your child. Orphans were kind of thought of as damaged just because they were orphans. And so Georgia Tan comes into the scenario and she begins to traffic in really cute children and adopt them out to wealthy and famous people. Joan Crawford, uh, her twins came from uh, Georgia Tan, Smiley Burnett, uh, June Allison and Dick Powell. Some of the biggest celebrities of the day had Georgia Tan babies. Some of the biggest politicians, Herbert Lehman, the governor of New York of Lehman Brothers. Um, so she does this and she publicizes this you as this ordinary person who desperately wants children you're seeing it and you think this is the most reputable acceptable thing in the world and you don't ask too many questions because you want it to be true and that is how she was able to get away with what happened so I'm doing all this digging and in the and looking at what's been written about this why haven't I heard of it this 5,000 children passed through the Tennessee Children's Home Society. And you start thinking of how many people, which I'm meeting them now that I'm out talking about it, this affects because um, in that generation that it happened, you've got families on the adopted side, you know, mothers, aunts, cousins, uh, siblings who are all tied up in this on the adopted side, and on the side of the families who lost children you've got all this extent that's a lot of people who had some direct contact with what happened and I'm thinking why haven't I heard of this um, what's been written about it so I find a couple nonfiction books about it um, there's there are a couple from 10 and 20 years ago um, one of them is a book called babies for sale and one of them is a book called the baby thief and and I start finding articles from the 90s because in the 90s the records were finally unsealed on these adoptions and people there was a rash of a bubbling up of reunions and there were a few TV made-for-TV movies Mary Tyler Moore starred as Georgia Tan in one of them 
So, you know, I'm looking at everything that's been written. Nobody's ever written it into a novel. I love that fictional format because I feel like when we go back and we relive history, we really understand it from the inside out. And when we understand our history and we actually feel it personally, then we're not so apt to let it repeat itself. So I was thinking, you know, who would tell this story? Who would tell the story? And I thought, you know, maybe a social worker who is young and idealistic and goes to work in, in this and finds out what's happening and tries to fight it. Um, I thought maybe a, a young pregnant girl who gets locked away in one of these homes for girls in trouble and finds out they're going to take her baby, you know. But what was really resonating with me were the stories of the children. What was it like to be a child and just because you're cute, because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you are plucked up out of your life and deposited in one of these for-profit boarding homes around the city where they were holding kids prior to adopting them out for profit. And I started really hearing these five little siblings on this riverboat who are growing up 10, 12, 7, 4, and 2 years old. And the oldest girl, Rill, began really telling me the story of what their life was like before and what happens to them like so many kids in Memphis when for some reason they cross the radar. The reason they end up on the radar of the Children's Home Society is um, their mother, Queenie, is about to have what's expected to be the sixth baby in this family. The midwife can't handle it on the boat and because it's twins. And uh, their father, Briny, has to take her across water from Mud Island where the shanty boaters camped into Memphis to have this baby. Hospitals, incidentally, were one of the places where Georgia Tan always had spotters operating. So this is what happens um, when Rill wakes up in the morning. She's been left on the shanty boat to take care of her brothers and sisters overnight alone. And this is what happens when she wakes up in the morning and realizes some things have gone very wrong with the birth. Chapter 12, Rill Foss, 1939. In my dreams, we're free on the river. The Model T engine briny fixed to the back of the boat drives us up water easy, like we hadn't got any weight at all. Queenie sits up top of the cabin like she's riding an elephant. Her head's tossed back, her hair flowing out from under her feathery red hat. She's singing a song she learned from an old Irishman in one of the shanty camps. Why ain't she pretty as a queen? Bryony asks me. The sun is warm and the song sparrows sing and the fat bass jump out of the water. A flock of white pelicans flies over in a big old air shape pointing north, which means the whole summer still ahead of us. There's not a paddle wheeler or a flat boat or a tug or an oil barge anywhere in sight. The river is ours, it's only ours. Well, and what's that make you? Bryony asked me in my dream. Princess Rill of Kingdom Arcadia, I shout out. And I know I am the luckiest little girl in the whole wide world. There ain't a better place to be than our Kingdom Arcadia. Bryony sets a honeysuckle flower crown on my head and he makes me a princess for real, just like the kings in all the storybooks did. In the morning, when I wake from that dream, there's still a sweet taste in my mouth. It lasts until I open my eyes and think about why my brothers and sisters and me are all in Queenie and Bryony's bed, flopped out across the mattress like a fisherman's catch all sweaty and slick. Queenie's not here. It hardly gets through my head before I know what's pulled me from my dream. Somebody's knocking on the door. My heart jumps up and I jump up with it, pulling one of Queenie's shawls over my nightgown while I cross the shanty floor. It's old Zed on the other side of the door. Old Zed who's always been like a granddaddy to us. But even through the window glass this morning, I can see that his white-whiskered face is long and sad. My gut pulls tight like a slipknot. 
The morning airs turned warm and steamy, but I opened the door and feel it right through the nighty Queenie sewed a ruffle to because I'd got so tall this past year. Queenie said a girl my legs not, had not to have her legs showing so much. I pulled the shawl tighter over my chest, not because of Zed or because I got any woman parts to hide. Queenie says that'll happen when it's time, and it just ain't time yet. But Zed's got a boy in his John boat this morning. The kid hides his face under a raggedy newsboy cap, looking at the bottom of the boat and not at me. Zed skips all the introducing. I know what that means, but I wish it didn't. Zed's hand falls heavy on my shoulder. It's meant for a comfort, but I want to run away from it. I want to scat off somewheres down the river bank, my feet flying so fast they barely leave tracks in the washed up sand. Tears shove up my neck and I swallow hard. Queenie's babies didn't make it out, Zed says. Something inside me dies. A little brother or a sister I was planning to hold like a new china doll. Not either one of them? I ask. Doc said no. Couldn't have saved neither of them. Said it wouldn't have mattered none if Briny would got your mama to the hospital sooner. Them babies just wasn't meant for this world, that's all. I shake my head trying to wick those words out of my ears like water after a swim. That can't be true, not in Kingdom Arcadia. The river's our magic. Briny's always promised it'll take care of us. Well, but what'd Briny say? I ask. He's pretty broke up about it. I left him there with your mama. They got some hospital papers they got to sign. Docs hadn't told her about losing the babies yet. I reckon Briny will do that when she's woke up good. She'll be all right, I reckon. She'll be all right? I hear it in my head again, but I know it ain't true. Nothing makes Queenie happier than a brand new sweet baby to cuddle. She's birthed all five of us with hardly more than a whimper. How could she have lost both of these two? Queenie ain't going to be all right. Not after this. So like so many kids in real life, it's that one incident. It's that one thing that brings them across the path of Georgia Tan and changes the paths of their lives forever. People have also asked me a lot, um, well, a few people have asked me whether that many people could live on a shanty boat, um, and the, the answer is yes. I actually found an, an, an old picture from around the turn of the century, and there are five little kids lined up on the porch and two or three adults, and the caption to this thing says, uh, seven, more picture, seven more members of the family were asleep in the back room, and I did not care to disturb them for the picture. Mm -hmm. So I guess it wasn't uncommon for shanty boaters to have big families. I don't know how they all slept in those little boats. Um, but it's digging into that world of the shanty boats and learning how these kids lived was one of the most interesting parts of researching this story because very little had been written about shanty boat life and shanty boat culture. And then thinking through what it was like for these kids whose lives they don't even know much about the outside world and suddenly they're deposited in it. The last question I am um, asked a lot when um, a book comes out is, um, what themes are behind it? What you know? What what what? Is, what's the overall theme? What does it mean? Um, what did it mean to me? What what do I want people to take away from it? This book, at its heart, honestly, is a story of political corruption. It is. It's a story of the reason that Georgia Tan was able to do this is Memphis was incredibly politically corrupt at the time. Boss Crump had Memphis, and Boss Crump had the state of Tennessee. And Georgia Tan had the ear and protection of Boss Crump. She literally could not be challenged in Memphis. She had the police, the social services, the juvenile court system. She had everything. And so the few times when someone did speak up, Number one, she was a bitter, dangerous enemy to have, and she had a lot of power. And secondly, um, 
it, there were times when prominent people, doctors, wrote letters of protest because she was taking preemies out of the hospital and the babies were dying. Um, there were times when judges protested the fact that so many of her adoptions were going through so fast and so many of her removals of custody from birth parents were going through so fast in certain, um, in certain, certain jurisdictions around the area. If those things made it to the state level and resulted in any attempts at legislation, she lobbied the state legislature against it, and those things either just disappeared in committee or they passed with exemptions for Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home Society. How did it finally end, people have asked me. Um, in the late 40s, the political worm turns in Memphis and Browning comes in, or in, in the state of Tennessee, Browning comes in as governor. The Browning camp is the opposite of the Crump camp. Um, Browning is very interested in dismantling all things Crump. He uh, appoints a special investigator who then digs into the story of the Tennessee Children's Home Society in Memphis and the place is closed. What do I hope people take away from the story? Um, there's something that the modern day character Avery says in the story uh, because the story is told in two threads. It's told in this historic thread and it's told in a modern day thread by the daughter of a, uh, a longtime senator in Aiken, South Carolina, and she's really just come home to take care of her father through cancer, but she's also sort of the political dynasty heir apparent in the family. And so she travels with her father to a press op and, at a nursing home and she meets an old woman who's going to send her on a quest for what happened to these five kids on the shanty boat in 1939. And she says something in there that was my takeaway from the story. Uh, she says somewhere in the story, she says, it's the things you want to believe that you look at, you need to look at the most closely of all. And that's what, that was my takeaway from it. The things that fall easy on my ear, the things that fit right with what I already believe, the things that affirm everything I want to think, I need to look at those things objectively and you know it, is this too good to be true does it make sense is there a price to be paid here and who's paying the price so that was my takeaway from the book beyond that I just hope it inspires people to be kind of that that one for one there are still plenty of kids out there today who have to lay their heads down and wonder am I safe how long will I be here what will these people do to me um, was anybody ever gonna love me for me there are still also, as happens in the story, plenty of elderly people in the nursing homes who, you know, could use a friendly face, a hug, a, somebody to come read to them. So, you know, we can't fix every problem in the world. Sometimes it seems like they're so big we get just compassion bombarded. But we can be that one for one, that one, one somebody for one somebody who needs, who needs something that we have to offer. So I hope it inspires that. Um, they asked me at a book festival not too long ago, you know, if you could write your dream book, what would it be? And um, I was thinking as the question was working its way down the panel to me, and when it got to me, uh, I knew what my dream book is just the book that, that changes the world. Um, books change the world inside us, and by that, it changes the world outside us. And that's why, you know, places like this, your libraries, um, your reading groups, that's reading in schools, that's why it matters. Because books have the opportunity to put us in the mind and heart and body and soul and shoes of another person. And when we've lived it and we see it out in the world, we think, I know what that, I understand how that feels. And hopefully that changes um, who we are. I'll close on one little funny story and then if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. But So as not to close on such a serious note. Um, so you never know in a book what will hang you up in research and where you'll find the answers. So one of the tough things in this story was just propulsion on the river. This is the end of the steam era. Um, it's the winding up of the gasoline era. And so just how the boats move around. And I needed, when they take Queenie across river and in a couple other scenes, I needed somebody to have a motorized John boat or a skiff, something with a motor on it. So I'm looking at what kind of boat motors were around then. And I come across one called a water witch and I like that name a water witch I just think it sounds interesting and mysterious a water witch and so I pick a water witch and a water witch turns out to be the hardest thing to research in the world um, 
So when you can't find out how they started the motor, you start fudging things like, instead of saying how they started the motor, you say things like, and the motor roared to life. <laughs> uh, so I just fudge my way through the scenes with the water witch. And fast forward some months, the book has gone into the publisher and gone through the auction and all these things. And um, I go for a writing weekend with one of my best writing friends, Judy Christie. And so we're brainstorming plots, and we're in this beautiful cabin her brother owns on Caddo Lake in Texas under the cypress trees with the hanging moss, and, and we're working. And meanwhile, next door, Sam the Bachelor Fisherman is over there, and Sam is a little lonely. And so Sam, when we're out, you know, he's out, and he's out on his deck, and I've got iced tea, y'all come over. And well, we're working, but we will. You know, we go out on the, um, out on the dock, and Sam's out on I'm cooking hot dogs later, y'all hungry? And so we get to the end of this trip, and finally Judy says, you know, we really, you, you need to see Sam's cabin. It's so beautiful, and he's done all the decorating himself, and he loves to fish. So we get over there, and y'all, I am like a photographer at a Paris runway. Because I raised two fishermen. I ordered girls, I got boys, I raised a couple fishermen. <laughs> this is a fisherman shack deluxe. Um, the toilet paper holder is a, is a fishing oh. reel. <laughs> The toilet seat is clear lucite with fishing lures embedded in it. Oh my, God. oh my God. The lamps are fishing poles. The lampshades are fishing hats. This place is incredible. And so I turn around to leave, and in the bay window is Sam's desk where he works. And beside the desk is a motor. And it's got these beautiful Art Deco lines. And I look at it. And I get a little closer and I see the W. Oh, and I look at Sam and I say, is that a water witch? <laughs> and Sam's eyes get big and they start to glitter. And he says, yes, that's my 1939 fully restored water witch. Oh, Which, y'all, is the year the story is set. Wow. Yeah. So I take two lessons from that. Um, one is you never know where your research will come from. And the second is you should never ignore your neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.